Well, good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Come on, stand up. It's that time. We're going to get started. We're going to worship the Lord together this morning. So join us. We will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. What's not to love about you? Heaven and earth adore you. Kings and kingdoms bow down. Son of God, you are the one, you are the one we're living for. You are the love that frees us, you are the light that leads us, like a fire burning, Son of God, you are the one. 
right. Welcome, family, to Three Rivers Church. If you're visiting with us today, this time we set aside to say welcome. We're glad you're here. We have a communication card in the, not the back of your pew racks, but in the back of the chairs. There's a small little pocket. You can find those there. Uh, if you need one, talk to your neighbors next to you. Ronnie uh, was reminding me he is really good. I don't know if you noticed, but if you haven't connected with someone, he will point to you and point to the person you need to connect with, and he will implore you to go connect with them. And as I watch that a lot, I go, man, we need to mature up in that. Sometimes we're so awkward with uh, meeting new people. This time we set aside, we say just welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, church family, it's good to see you. And also... I just wanted to point out something obvious. There's, there's no pews here today. And last Sunday after church, as we were going through and uh, we were pulling pews out and pulling things out the ground and sweeping, um, there were some things that were going on. You know, we're all given different gifts from God. In the middle of a time that was excitement, there were kids laughing and having a good time. There was a, a closeness of church members working together for uh, a cause uh, there was also sadness. And sometimes we, we may miss that. It's kind of, it reminds me of like Christmas time. You know, we get very excited. Um, and around us are people that are holding on for dear life because they've experienced some, something really tough at that time. And Christmas doesn't bring joy to their heart first. It brings sadness to their heart. Although it's the time we set aside to worship a Savior. There are some people that have been with this church building for a whole bunch of years. A lot of good memories of people that have gone on and passed. And to see uh, those pews come out probably was really difficult. I, I can't imagine how difficult that is. But I didn't want us this morning just to stop and uh, give a little honor to those faithful saints that were in this building long before we stepped foot in here and their dedication, their faithfulness brought about a building, a building that's paid for, pews that were used faithfully week after week, year after year. And just thankful for their, for their faithfulness. As we're excited, we just remind ourselves these chairs one day will be gone too. And so will these walls. And so will this carpet. And so will us. We live in a very temporary place. God has called us to not be a part of this world, but to be in this world. And God has called us, while we're in this temporary place, to not forget that this is not our home. And we shouldn't get attached to anything too much. When we find ourselves attached to it too much, it's a reminder that we probably need to get our spiritual eyes open because we're not called to be excited about chairs or pews or carpet or even the song that was shared. You know, Amazing Grace was a brand new song one time. I promise you, when it was sang the first time, there was uh, some people that probably said, I don't know if I like that song. You're like, no, nah, that's not true. I promise you there was because people are people. That never changes. But... We're here today because we've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he's given us a brand new life and not just a new life and forgiveness, he's given us a mission, a calling, a purpose, and it's all about glorifying God. Amen? So when we leave this building today and we leave these chairs, it really doesn't matter what we sat in, but it matters what's gone in. Amen? So today we're going to worship Jesus together. We're going to give thanks and glory and praise for what he's done in our life and what he will do in lives of people generations after us because of our faithful service to him and teaching truth in the building he's given us for whatever time he's given it. Amen? Are you ready to worship? Yeah. Father, we come before you. Lord, I thank you so much that you provide for us. Lord, you give us provision, and from that provision, we give back to you. Lord, we, we don't pass offering plates, but we, we take up tithes and offering every week. Um, Lord, we just thank you that you provide so richly for us and that we can give back to you such a small portion so that we can be a part of furthering your kingdom and your glory. But Father, you call us to do more than just give of tithes and offerings. You call us to be living sacrifices, so may we... 
Come together this morning as one people, one voice, and worship the one true God. Lord, may we dig into your word today, lean in, and let the Holy Spirit teach us and awaken us and, and guide us and share with us the things that you would have us to do when we leave this place. And Father, let us not forget that this is not our home, and our home is so much glorious than this temporary place, and what we have in you is so much glorious than anything that we can imagine for ourselves here in this temporary time. May we be about our Father's work this week. In your son's name we pray, amen.
eyes to thee. Holy, 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 you are merciful and mighty. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Sing that last verse with me. Think about what it is we're singing. Sing this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Pastor Zane is, sounds awful. Uh, and he, uh, you know, when you're a singer or a preacher or you talk for a living, it's very challenging when you can't talk or sing or do those other things that you need to do. So uh, pray for him. He gave me the encouragement of, I'm glad it's you and not me. 
So sometimes you, uh, you know, when, when I was a solo pastor, even when I was sick, I wasn't sick for the time you had to preach. And I know that uh, our other guys have experienced the same thing. The Lord always gives you that strength to, to press through and, and accomplish the mission. So we are glad to see you. And, and I noticed uh, as I'm looking about the room, I haven't seen anyone fall over yet. I haven't seen anybody just uh, collapse in, in misery, so I'm glad the seats are working good for you. Uh, we have instituted a new policy of no food or drink in here so that we can preserve the chairs as best we can as being people. And you're thinking, well, Pastor Ian, I'll just spill on the carpet. Well, that's true. And so what we have done is we've kind of taken a lackadaisical attitude. If you spill a cup of coffee, pff, it's all right. It's, it's, it'll just make the carpet more even looking. Well, we're, we want to prepare you for the new carpet that comes in. And as Pastor Mark said, I was actually here in the olden days when the building was built. Uh, I was part of Victory Baptist Church back from 1994 until 2006. So I saw a lot of things. And the, the carpet has uh, it's, it's weathered well. If you do the math, from 1996 when the building was finished in December of 96 until uh, today, that's a lot of years. That's older than some of you have been alive. So we are looking forward to changing that. Last week, Pastor Zane told us about the fruit of the Spirit. That was fun, wasn't it? All the wonderful things like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, gentleness, kindness. That'll hit you, won't it? All of those things have been given to you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been given to you in that holy fruit basket, and you have them. Maybe it's not that nice, wonderful, juicy watermelon that you look so forward to in the summer, but over time, those qualities develop and mature to enable us to represent Christ and interact in a godly manner, a godly manner to all those around us. This morning, we'll shift our fundamental study and look at following Christ. So turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at several verses as we look at the Lordship of Christ. Colossians chapter 1. This is written by Paul. It's in your New Testament. If you find Philippians, keep going. Galatians, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, so you can remember it, by the old mnemonic, General Electric Power Company. That's how I remember. General Electric, and it's amazing all these, uh, the tricks that you learn to help find, all, like all the T's in the New Testament are together. All of them. It's hard to find Jude. Well, I'm, uh, he's right there, but that, not that Jude. Jude, the half-brother of Christ, is right before Revelation. So if you turn to the back, go to the left. All kind of ways. Don't think that as, uh, as pastors that we somehow we take this pill as soon as we're ordained that we can remember where every book in the, in the Bible is. Malachi. I mean, I got to look at the index on some of these things, okay? It's okay. Obadiah, he's in there somewhere in the Old Testament. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having say... Uh, having made peace through the blood of the cross, blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, 
Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. We're talking about the Lordship of Christ this morning. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful to be in this place. Lord, no matter what the looks are, the appearance are, Lord, we're grateful to be here gathered together through the common bond that is found through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we give you praise and honor for what you have accomplished and for what you will accomplish today. Lord, help us to soak in the message of Scripture. For asking in Jesus' name, amen. There are some objections people have in following a God that cannot be seen. Think about your life before you made a decision, before you made a choice, before you determined to follow Jesus, who is the Christ, before you accepted his free gift of salvation. Think about before that. How can you comprehend something you cannot see? How can you relate to an invisible God? When you think about that, the questions just start flowing. If I can't see him, Will he hear me? If a tree falls in the forest and no one can hear it, does it make a sound? Yes, it does. Well, how do you know? Because I know physics. If I can't see him, how do I know he's there? How do we relate to someone we cannot see? These are difficulties we face in our own journey. But there are also difficulties we face when introducing Christ to others. We tend to address these challenges by saying our pet verses like, well, we walk by faith and not by sight. But wouldn't it be much easier to walk by sight and not by faith? I know for me, I would much prefer that. But where is the faith, the determination to believe in something you cannot see, the overwhelming conviction to know that something is true and right and accurate. And before you go all pious on me, I can tell you you have faith in many, many things that you deal with every day. You cannot see gravity, yet you, whether you believe it or not, it is there, it's holding you down in your seats. You believe in conscience, you believe in love, and you can't see love. Well, I know what love is. <laughs> Not as, yeah, you know the quote. But you see the effects of gravity. You don't see things flying about. You cannot, you cannot see love. You can just see the effects of love. So we have these difficulties, in fact, Paul addresses these difficulties in his letter to the Colossians. The opening verses of Colossians that we did not read gives you some really great insight into this church. There was a man named Epaphras who told Paul of the work that was occurring there. If you do a little research, you learn that Paul taught at the school of Tyrannus in, uh, in Ephesus for two years. According to Acts chapter 19, all of Asia heard the word. Now that in itself is a remarkable concept that all of Asia heard the word. Although there is nothing solid, nothing concrete, it's likely that Epaphras met Paul in Ephesus and became his student. Colossians 4.12 tells us Epaphras was a bond slave of Christ and sent his greetings to the church, and Paul told them Epaphras labored earnestly in prayer for the church. 
Colossians is known as a prison epistle or a prison letter. There's a number of letters that Paul wrote while he was incarcerated. It seems that Epaphras was with Paul. And it seems like he gave Paul all of the firsthand information as to what was going on in Colossae. Paul wrote this letter to combat false teachers that were undermining the truth that Epaphras taught them. It is highly probable that Paul met a runaway slave named Onesimus in prison and shared the gospel with him. Onesimus would then get saved. Philemon was likely a member of the church at Colossae, and Paul took the opportunity to send a letter to Onesimus' owner named Philemon, urging him to accept Onesimus as a brother, which is much more greater and gooder than a slave. You can read that in Paul's letter to Philemon. Everything is connected. In Philemon 23, Paul called Epaphras a fellow prisoner and greeted Philemon, who must know Epaphras. So Paul makes two statements about Jesus Christ. First, in verse 15, he says, he is the image of the invisible God, and then he says, he is firstborn of all creation. Now, image is a really, really cool word. There are two meanings that need to be evaluated, and they're both generally there when you talk about image. But one tends to dominate the other. When image is used, in the first case, it denotes a material representation, usually a deity. Deities were typically uh, images... Let me, hold, hold, let me back up. I'm getting, I'm getting excited about this. Uh, images were commonly made in human form known as anthropomorphic. They take on the shape of a human. But they're also made in animal form, and that was known as theriomorphic. Now, images were made to display some prominent characteristic of that deity. In the Canaan god of El, he was uh, looking like a bull. That gives indication to his power and strength and his fertility. The Hindu god Ganesh, if you know the Hindu god Ganesh, he's shaped like an elephant. Indicates his ability to remove obstacles, right? You just push things over. So these images were not just a visual picture of the god, but were thought to provide a dwelling place for them to allow them to be in more than one place at once, be in multiple places at the same time. So Jesus is the image of God. His image represents or symbolizes God. Now in the second case, image means manifestation. In this case, the symbol is more than a symbol. It actually carried the presence of the object. Paul means that Jesus, being made flesh, allowed God to be placed into our understanding. Jesus manifested God. Hebrews 1.3 says, And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. John 1.14, we know this verse well, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The invisible God became visible in Jesus Christ. He is the direct manifestation, the direct representation of God whom we cannot see. So if you've seen Jesus, you've said you've seen Jesus. God. In fact, Jesus said that in Matthew. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, what's interesting is the second commandment prohibited, uh, prohibited images made in the likeness of God. Hmm. So you had to create a mental picture of what God looked like. And now all of us, for some reason, throughout time, we have all formulated the mental image that God looks like an old man he has white hair and a long white beard. He has a flowing white robe. All of us, you can go anywhere across America. What, hey, what do you think God looks like? Oh, he's old. 
old, had long, long white hair. They don't have barbers in heaven, apparently. Long white hair, long beard. A lot of times you'd get him confused with Father Time or Gandalf the Great or Magnificent. I don't know what, what his name is. Gandalf the Gray? So he would have long gray hair, I guess. So we all come up with the same image. We don't, wouldn't it just be easier to have a picture of him? And then, of course, you've heard me mention this, the stereotypical picture of Jesus. He's looking like this, off to that direction. Pointed chin, you know, pointed chin, beard, neatly trimmed beard, by the way. Nice hair. I mean, nice hair. Fairly light skinned, it's the same picture. I don't know who creates these images, but you know, there was nothing to really look at. Even Moses, when he said, God, I want to see you, he said, Hey, I tell you what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put you in the cleft of the rock, I'm gonna put my hand over you. You'll just be able to see, you'll just be able to see me as I walk by, not look into my face. When Moses went up to the mountain to spend time with God, his face became so brilliant, so radiant that he had to cover it up with a veil. Now, men don't wear veils. But Moses had to wear a veil or else the other people couldn't be around him. The longer he spent away from God, the dimmer his countenance became. So there's something there, in there? The more time he spent away from God, the radiance or the brilliance of his countenance dimmed the longer he spent away from God. The more time you spend with God, the brighter your countenance will become. No, all your, power, all your problems don't go away. I mean, when he came down, this is a different message, but man, he came down from the mountain, the mountain and Aaron Dunn had lost his mind. What did Aaron do? He made God in the image of a golden calf that just somehow, I have no idea, Mo Moses, no idea, we, I, all of a sudden, walking by and this calf comes out of the, it just came out. I don't know what happened. Aaron was a challenge. You had to create an image of what God looked like, but I want you to picture in your mind a perfect and holy God who is eternal, timeless, can be everywhere at one time, knows your thoughts, knows the hairs on your head, knows how many carpet fibers are in this room. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're going to eat for lunch in 23 years, four months, six days, and 12 minutes. He knows what grade you will get on your next test, he will know the ones that you will miss. How can you put him into an image? And even if you could, it would pale in comparison to a God that made sidewalks of pure gold. We think about a new road that has been paved, and man, is that smooth. Oh, that road is so nice. It smells so nice. Dave makes roads. I've asked him to make a road of our parking lot, and for some reason, he's not gotten back to me. <laughs> and we think about how smooth it is, and man, those guys, they know what they're doing. God made the sidewalks of gold, and you think you can comprehend God? I encourage you, if you ever meet someone that can fully explain God, run, run, because he is a heretic. Anything that we can think of pales into who he really is. But wait a minute. Genesis 127, the Bible says God made man in his own image. And speaking of authority, Paul told the Corinthians that man is the image and glory of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49, Paul said, so also is it written, the first, man, the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last Adam was a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, 
earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, earthy one, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly one, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also bear the image of the heavenly. Jesus was unique in that he was made in the image of man, the image of Adam, and in the image of God. In using this word image, Paul means to say that Jesus is the perfect representation and manifestation of God and man. That is difficult to comprehend. That is hard. He is the image of the invisible invisible God. Verse 15 then says, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn is a compound word. Everybody knows what first means. It means, well, first, number one. Born means to beget or bring forth. We have little babies here in this room that were born. We have one that is getting ready to be born, pretty excited. Emma is coming, right? Emma's gonna come soon. Tomorrow or Tuesday, tomorrow or Tuesday, what, you know, whenever. Tuesday, back in my day, you just, you didn't know. It just, you just didn't know. I got, uh, I got the elbow in the side at about five o'clock in the morning said it's time I've been in labor now I Carrie said I've been in labor since about midnight but I wanted to let you sleep I mean I thought that loves like a, that woman I love her so but now apparently you can schedule th- these things out you, I mean you can even look you can get a picture of what the kid looks like and p- kid has never come out yet D- technology y'all you take it for granted Carrie was at, the, at uh, thrifting with Kinsey, my granddaughter, who was 11, and she came across this phone. I think I told you this a, a little while ago. And Carrie said, hey, what is that? Kinsey knew it was a phone. She said, uh, dial my number. Yeah, our kids are so smart, aren't they? They don't even know how to dial a telephone. Firstborn. It referred to a special place associated with birthright in the family. Firstborn son particularly was important in the family. The meaning morphed into first in priority. And that's the meaning Paul has in mind in this verse. Jesus is God's represent, uh, representative and heir and has the responsibility and management for all creation. Was it Jacob? Uh, uh, was it uh, Israel that blessed Jacob and Esau. Remember, Jacob presented, hold on, I, I, Carrie always tells me, don't think of anything while you're preaching. <laughs> so who was the guy, the old guy that had long white hair and a long beard? He was old and when his, it was Jacob and Esau, right? Israel went and he went to bless them. It, right, it's Isaac and Jacob and Israel. Uh, I mean, Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And, and Isaac did this, right? To bless them. And he said, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't do that. That's not how it works. You're supposed to bless my firstborn. Firstborn means a lot. Firstborn. Jesus is God's representative and heir, has the responsibility and management of all creation. He is firstborn over all creation. That doesn't mean he was the first to be born. Paul's not intending to use that word to indicate Jesus is the first one in creation. That's not what he means. He means that Jesus is preeminent in relation to creation. Now that's important to help us understand who he actually is. Remember, what's the point? We're trying to relate to an invisible God. Jesus has positional authority as Lord of our lives. Positional authority. So 
So next Paul tells us why Jesus is supreme. Verse 16 says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Three key elements are set off by the phrases by him, through him, and for him. By him is literally translated in him. This should be understood as in his mind or in his sphere of influence and responsibility. In a real sense, it means that Jesus is the author of creation. It was his idea. But wait, you say. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Absolutely true, and we know that John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know that to be true. Of course, God the Father was there in creation. God decided to make it happen, and Jesus is the one who made it come to pass. Think of God as the architect, and Jesus as the builder. Through him means that creation came about by means of Jesus' creative energy. For him gives us the idea that Jesus is the goal of creation. Now, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Everything exists to demonstrate the glory of Jesus. Everything. By all accounts, the statue of David, it's not a statue, really, the Statue of Liberty is a statue. It's in the name. David is a, for all you highbrow people, what is David called? A sculpture. A sculpture means you can charge to look at it. A statue, you can just go look. So by all accounts, the sculpture of David is probably the most famous sculpture in the entire world. Who sculpted it? He later became a turtle. Michelangelo. So Michelangelo wasn't the one that started it, interestingly enough. Michelangelo came and looked at this piece of Carrera marble, big block of marble, and he saw the sculpture of David. Now, you and I could look at that same block and we would see a big block of marble. But not only did Michelangelo see the, de see the sculpture of David, he saw the details, the intricacies of David's hair and his arms and his fingernails. Michelangelo saw all of that. Once the sculpture was complete, we are still to this day talking about the amazingness of that sculpture, the beauty of that sculpture. And when we think of that sculpture, who do we think of? Michelangelo, what an artist he must be, how creative and detailed, and man, that guy can really handle a chisel well. I mean, this thing is beautiful, and it has stood the test of time. So it is with creation. Each sunrise is different. Each sunset is different. And even though we can predict the weather in St. Mary's, Georgia, in August, that it's going to be somewhere between 96 and 98 degrees, there is a 50-50 chance of afternoon thunderstorms. Some may be severe. There are going to be partly cloudy skies with high humidity and a UV index of 10 I did not go to meteorology school, and I can accurately predict the weather in the summer. In the winter, today's high will be 61 degrees. Overnight lows will be 14. Tomorrow will be 84 degrees with a chance of snow in the late afternoon. We use the heat in the morning and the air conditioning in the afternoon, and we always keep the fan running. This is the south. Paul listed the two dimensions of creation when he said both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. These are things that are visible to us on the earth. The details, the color, the complexity, the diversity, all bring glory to the Lord. When you walk on the beach and you feel the sand between your toes, you look at the beauty, you think about the magnificence of Jesus who created it all. When you look into the sky and you see the stars that cannot be numbered, you think of the magnificence of Jesus who created it all. When you look at anything in nature, you look at the beauty of it all, even from spiders to snakes, the beauty and complexity of it all. All animals have a purpose except gnats. But wait, gnats really are there to provide food for the bats. Well, just get rid of the bats. Well, they eat lots of bugs. There are good bugs, like, like cockroaches. Those are not good, I'll just tell you. And we've got people who have a whole entire profession that have made a career out of killing bugs so they can't be good. Don't kill snakes. Rehome them. 134, duck blind way. <laughs> they all have a reason. Bearded dragons. Iguanas. Apparently I'm on a reptile kick. You got the one hump camel. You also have a two humper. Both serve different purposes. Camels can go a long time walking through the desert, not get a drink. Sometimes you can ride a horse with no name through the desert. <laughs> See, the complexity of creation points to the Lord. The invisible things point to the Lord. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he said, for our struggle, are we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual, forkness, fork, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In the context of Colossians, the thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities seem to indicate spiritual beings. No matter who they actually are, Paul argues that Christ is superior to them. If we would just understand that our, that our enemy is not humanity, there are people that do dumb, bad, awful things. But you need to understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, though flesh and blood seems to cause us the biggest heartache and hurt. We still are submissive or we need to be submitted in our bodies because they are they are fleshly sinful bodies I tell you I'm broke down next month I will be I will be 60 years old si I know compared to some people that's not old but compared to other people, they wonder how I'm still alive. 60 years old. I'm glad I'm 60. Well, I'm not 60 yet. I can't change it. I went to the dermatologist last week. He hacked off some more cancer spots on my head, zapped some few things on my face, and I said, Doc, can you do something about my neck? I'm starting to look really saggy in here. Can you just like staple it back or something? I'm like, well, you know, I can't change it. Even if my neck looked good, I'd still be broke down. Yesterday I was working at, uh, at uh, we bought a house that my son owned for uh, years and had suffered a fire five years ago. I've been working over there. Kinsey told Carrie, said, tell granddad not to fall off a ladder. I fell off ladder. I wasn't up high, but because of my youthfulness in my mind, I was able to catch myself on the rafters, so I didn't fall, but my left side really, really hurts. But thanks be to God, I continued working, ignoring all signs of pain and displeasure and discomfort in my body, because I can't, look, if I stopped 
working because I was in pain, I would not work another day in my life. When you get old, it happens. One day, you young people will know. Now think about Emma getting ready to be born. I mean, man, just brand new life. Her bones are rubbery. I mean, you could drop her. Nothing will happen. <laughs> don't. Don't do that. Don't, don't drop your kids until they get a little bit older. Then you might you know, need to throw them to the ground. But don't, don't drop the new ones. And I think of Gabriel, who's he's, you know, just over one, and Natalie, they're, I mean, they're growing in maturity. They're walking, and, you know, you can talk to them, and they, they understand what you're saying. They just can't formulate the words back. I mean, this is incredible and all points to the magnificence of Jesus. See, all things, all things he is before, and in him all things hold together. This points to the practical, ongoing nature of Christ's involvement with the world. He didn't create it and then went hands off, as some people argue. He's still involved. He's the one that keeps the stars aligned. He's the one that makes the moon be full and unfull. He's the one that controls the rain and the weather. You want to talk about a perfect prognostication when it comes to the weather? God knows everything that's going to happen every single day. He is perfect. He's the one that keeps gravity in place. He is the one behind human conception. He is the author of life. Every life is precious in his sight. I don't care how the method or the process of that conception happened. All life is, is precious. From the moment of conception, we believe that life begins and that life is precious in the sight of God. It must be preserved. Everything that happens is because Jesus caused it or allowed it. Everything in your life has happened that is happening has filtered, as Zane said last week, through the loving fingers of an awesome, incredible God. Not one thing that happens in your life catches God by surprise. Not one thing. Finally, Paul provides the practical nature of Christ as Lord. Look at Colossians 18. He is also head of the body of the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. This body that Paul mentions is a great metaphor for the church. Paul frequently uses it, but it has different meanings depending on the context. Here, Paul's talking about organizational structure. The church is a living, breathing organism that goes through stages of life just like a human body. When we merged in 2017, man, we, we had trouble crawling. You know, we, time went on, and we, it's like we would crawl, and we would, we would stand up, and we'd take the first couple steps, and then it's like someone would come down and push us over. Man, that, the, first, the first year, remember Pastor Zane? Mark, I mean, that first year was rough. Then, we, then, then, then year two came, and I felt like I had contracted cancer. I was needing chemotherapy and radiation, counseling, I needed massages. I had never got one. I mean, I needed help. Pastor Zane needed help. Pastor Mark needed help. I mean, it was rough. Then year, th year three, this never happens in churches. You know, as we're learning to walk, we're like, I can, I can hold myself up. Bam! We get back to infancy stage. Man, I gotta learn how to crawl again. I gotta learn how to, how to walk and pick my, and feed, feed myself without dribbling it down my shirt. It was challenging. But we grew. We grew. Ephesians 4 speaks of the body maturing. Ephesians 5 speaks of the authority in the home and the redemptive role Jesus plays in the church. Paul is talking about the leading and guiding principles of Christ. Christ existed before the body, the church. Christ was around before the church began.
but the church cannot function, cannot exist apart from Christ. Oh, Pastor Ian, there are churches all over. Exactly, they're just organizations that are devoid of Christ. There are actual organized churches that, that Jesus is not welcome in. How can that be a church? It's only, it's only in name. Not in function, not in form, not in biblical accuracy, not in biblical authority. It's just a group of people. You may as well be called the Rotary Club. Jesus existed before the church. A concept that many people, even in the church, fail to realize is that the church is a visible representation of Christ. A visible representation of Christ. See, this is the practical aspect of being a follower. Even if you're not a member of a local church, and you should be, you'll hear somebody teach about that in the future in this series. Even if you're not a member of a local church, if you're a follower of Christ, you're a member of the universal church. Not universalism, everybody will be saved. That's not what that means. The church at large, if you're a follower of Christ, you're a member of the church, whether you're here in America or you're in Romania or Ukraine. We had uh, Galentine's, a, a big Galentine's night thing for the ladies last night. I saw the picture on Facebook. I was already asleep when Carrie got home. Uh, man, there, that place was packed out. So ladies, if you missed out, you missed a wonderful time, but I'm sure they'll be planning something else. And I hear Angela, and Angela slayed it uh, with the... And, uh, with the message that she brought, and uh, I think all the ladies had a wonderful time. Ladies, did you have a wonderful time? All right, if you're going to clap, clap for real. Don't give me none of this lame thing. Give it up. I wasn't there. I was counting the minutes until I could move from my nap to my bed. Everyone who is a professing, genuine believer in Christ is a member of the church at large, no matter where you are in the world. You have that common bond of, of Christ. That common, I mean, you can hit it off and talk with people no matter what country they're from because you're united by the blood of Christ. So how are you representing? Are you the wise, elderly statesman or the matriarch? Are you the entitled teenager that thinks they know it all? Are you the friend that makes promises but never keeps them? Are you the whiny three-year-old throwing a temper tantrum because he didn't get his way? Are you that tiny little baby that can't wait for his next meal? And when they're not getting fed properly, they let you know. See, all of us represent when we are a member of the church. And remember, the church is the visible representation of Jesus Christ. And if you're a member of the church, that means you are a visible representation of Jesus Christ. Well, Pastor Ian, people shouldn't look at me. Look, Paul said he was the, the greatest of sinners and yet we talk all the time about following Paul. We teach what Paul says. Now how dumb are we if he is such a horrible person, is such a non-example of how to be in our Christian faith, he's written at least half the New Testament, we teach him all the time, but we shouldn't follow him? He says he's the chiefest of sinners. So you may think, no, I don't want people following me. They'll just, they won't have to follow. You've heard this statement. People wouldn't have to follow me long before they learned who I really was. Y'all, I know. That's me too. But remember, we're growing. We're in stages of life. How are you representing? 
He is the head of the body and he is the firstborn of the dead. It adds another dimension to his lordship. Jesus reigns supreme because of his resurrection. If he had just died, he simply would have been a dead great teacher. That's not what separates him from everybody else. It's the resurrection. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Sin has corrupted every aspect of life. Every single aspect of life has been corrupted by sin. But wait, grace can overcome every single sin that has ever been committed. Grace will overrule sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is Jesus Christ, and by faith we can accept his grace, his unmerited favor that will overturn sin and break that cycle. We talk about cycles in life, welfare cycles, domestic violence cycles. Well, I am a sin cycle. My parents were not saved. My dad got saved a year before he died. I was not raised in church. I was not raised to follow God. But thanks be to him that he saw fit to put Bill Moore in my life that taught me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I made a decision for him in December 1983 and have not looked back. There was never a period of time where I said, oh, this isn't working for me. But there have been times I said, this isn't working for me. But I never quit. Never gave up. If you want to look at me, look at me because I follow Christ, but I prefer to cut out the middleman and just follow Jesus. Look to him for guidance. Look to him for what you need to walk this faith walk. Everything can be redeemed by grace. You got a rough marriage, tough marriage, marriage on the rocks, Grace can go a long way in restoring your marriage. It ain't over until it's over. Kids are of the devil. Not my, not my kid, Pastor Ian. Let me remind you that it was a kid who dug a hole in pew number two in that row. My kid would never do that. Yeah, your kid would do a lot of things. You're just too blind to see what them nasty kids do. Talk to a teacher, and they will tell you what kids do. Talk to a principal. Pastor Mark, I ran into a kid the other day. I said, uh, where do you go to school, little fella? He said, Crooked River Elementary. I said, do you know my good friend, Dr. Lang? And he went, said, oh, you know him like that. Said, he's a great, great man, isn't he? He's a wonderful, and he, the kid's just like, I don't want to say nothing. <laughs> Word's going to get back. Man. Colossians 1.21 says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, as he speaks to the church, Paul tells them what they were. They were alienated. It means estranged. It means far from God, separated. They were hostile. They were enemies of God in their mind because of their evil deeds. James 4.4 4 says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. They stood in opposition. This, these people stood in opposition to God, and it didn't have to be in physical opposition. But Paul says they opposed him in their minds. As we consider the lordship of Christ, you oppose Jesus in your mind. Are you rebelling against his word? Are you rebelling against the authorities he has placed over you? Do you resist the direction he sends you? That's what the Colossians did. But then Paul lays it on them. Verse 22 says, yet. Yet indicates a contrast. You were hostile. You were alienated, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death 
in order to present you before him holy and blameless, blameless and beyond reproach. Blameless means innocent of wrongdoing. Beyond reproach means cannot be accused. This is who you are in Christ. Blameless. Well, Pastor Ian, I've done so many things. Before Christ, you are blameless because of his death, because of his resurrection. You can't even be accused of any wrongdoing because of Christ. And here's where the Lordship comes in. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. A relationship with Christ is more than making a profession of faith. In these last two verses, Paul contrasts the past, the present, and the future. They were formerly alienated. They have been reconciled, and now they are fully expected to continue on. So the, the structure of the verse actually reads, assuming or presuming or since you continue in the faith. There are hard days that I've been through that I wanted to quit, but I still got up at 4.40 in the morning. I still brushed my teeth. I still shaved so I looked good to nobody. I came in the office. I still studied. I still prayed. I still did what I was supposed to do. Even though in my flesh I wanted to quit because quitting is easy. Man, it's hard to keep it going. But thankfully Zane would wander in sometime around 10. 10-ish, unshaven, wearing his jammy bottoms. Now, he don't wear his jammy bottoms. And he comes in and he sits in my office with his Mountain Dew, slides the coaster over and says, hey. I'm like, yes. Trying to work here, man. And then we sit and we commiserate. And like, Zane, I'm having a hard time. And he listens. Drinks his Mountain Dew, and he gets up and leaves. What kind of help is that? It's just the presence. Mark will give me a call, shoot me a text. Stop by. Hey, just wanted to check in. How you doing? See, the relationship is more. Paul is teaching that a genuine conversion naturally produces a lifelong pursuit for Christ. Lifelong. No wilderness periods, unbiblical. No backsliding periods, unbiblical. No times of deconstructing your faith, unbiblical. All the Bible teaches is make a decision for Christ, and then the Bible is so naive that it thinks you will actually follow it. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, this is what you were back here, but through Jesus Christ, this is what you have become, and this is what you now are. There's no room for making excuses for the poor decisions we make. And we're so hesitant in the church. Well, you know what? You're having an affair, and that's, that's wrong. And you need to confess your sin and repent. Well, you're being judgmental. All right, call me Judge Judy. I don't care. And I'm pretty sure that everything in our lives, God has already judged. I don't need to judge the sin of homosexuality. God did. I am simply sharing the truth. Now, I'm not saying be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Or you're having an affair, and I will give you 30 minutes to notify your spouse, or I am putting it in the church Facebook group. Not going to do that. I'm not going to be unkind. There's only, y'all, there's only two confidences I will keep. And I forgot what they are, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's only two confidences I will break. If you're going to kill somebody else, don't expect me to keep that quiet. If you're going to kill yourself, well, it depends on who you are. No, no, it doesn't. 
I'm not going to keep those two confident. But if you want to come confess that you robbed a bank, I will encourage you to make it right. There is no expectation for continued sin. But that's what we do in the church, isn't it? Oh, well, it's all right. No, it's not. Oh, oh, you don't tithe? It's all right. We'll just ask Gary to double up. We'll ask Tom. Oh, Tom's active duty. We'll just double up. That's nonsense. If you're not tithing, well, we're going to talk about giving. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, God does, there's no New Testament, I'll just, just to put this out there, there's no New Testament commandment to tithe. There's not. Pastor Ian, does that mean I can quit giving? No, you can quit tithing though. The Bible talks about generous giving. And there's, uh, it's in some of the older manuscripts where generous giving is defined by the administrative pastor. You're gonna catch up in just a second. (laughs) Generous is a subjective term. Remember the widow? She practiced generous giving. How much did she give? All she had. We're not gonna tell you when that message is coming up. Lordship means intentionally pursuing Christ. It doesn't mean perfection, but pursuit. It's not haphazard. It's built into the new DNA that runs through your body, and that DNA belongs to Jesus Christ. It's intentional, and it's a priority. That means decisions need to be made as we walk this walk of faith. Do the choices you make indicate the lordship of Christ? When was the last time you actually spent conversation, you spent time in conversation with the Lord? Not, not, not praying like, Lord, I need help with my grades, my job, my family, my finances, but just spend time in conversation. Lordship means yielding your life to Christ. It's an absolute and total surrender. We need to move away from the easy believism that's taught in the church. Just believe, just believe. Followers need to move from belief to surrender to obedience. There is no give up or quit. There is no stopping when it gets hard, and it will. When you consider the magnificence of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, why hold back? You Georgia fans didn't hold back. You went nutsoid when the Jacksonville Jaguars made the playoffs. You didn't hold back. Some of y'all got tattoos. Well, probably not. But you didn't hold back. Why is it when we come to, when we talk about Christ, we well, we must be pious and reverent. No, we must not. Maybe that's why we are not attractive to the world is because we look just like the world. Maybe if we demonstrated the, the fruit of the Spirit that Pastor Zane shared with us, the incredible love, kindness, respect, gentleness, patience we are demonstrating, maybe then we would start looking like Jesus and maybe we would start to see revival in our community as the gospel of Christ runs rampant through all of the families and households in our community. Paul was concerned the Colossians were moving away from the hope of the gospel and he wanted to remind them of the lordship of Christ and why it is imperative in the lives of all believers. How are you representing Christ? Is Jesus your Lord? We need to move beyond salvation to lordship. Will you pray with me? Father, when we, consider, when we consider Jesus Christ as our Lord, 
Lord, I wonder how am I measuring up? Lord, I can preach and teach, but Lord, help me to be self-reflective. How can I represent you better? How can I demonstrate a life that is committed? Lord, I know this can be difficult for people to hear because we just think about all of our failures, all of our poor decisions, our wrong actions. But Lord, in a true and real and fundamental way, today is new. Through the grace and mercies of God, today is a new beginning, a new day. It doesn't matter what yesterday was. It doesn't matter our actions in the past. For Lord, our history does not define us, but it certainly does shape us. So Lord, help us to move from simple belief. Help us to move into surrender and from surrender to obedience. Lord, may we truly represent the magnificence of who you are. Father, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Who stood before creation? Eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion. My soul now to stand You stood before my failure And carried the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what can I say, and what can I do, but offer this heart, oh God, completely to you? So what can I say? just a quick seat. Uh, not a lot of new news to pass on. Uh, don't forget the Walk for Life is uh, one of Skylark's fundraisers for the year. It's on Saturday, March 4th at our waterfront on St. Mary Street. The walk begins at 9 a.m. and you can register beforehand. And if you want to get more information about that, please see Wanda. Where'd Wanda go? I don't know where Wanda is. Wanda's in the nursery. So if you go into the nursery, you can ask her also how to volunteer for the nursery, if you want to do that. Uh, thank you to all who had helped last week after church. I think there was probably 
I don't know, 30 people or so, and it was from uh, old people like me all the way down to uh, Andrew Canode and uh, Emma Agee were helping, and we put them to work. Everybody did a wonderful job. We got done in just under three hours, uh, and that was a huge, huge, huge I mean, big. It was just big. It was. Uh, we thank you for that uh, so much. If you happen to know, we think we're not sure, but maybe possibly they're the two 17-foot pews that are in the hallway. We think because someone may have said this that somebody wanted those, but now we're not. We're not so sure. So if you know someone who said or even imagined owning those and having them in their home. They've got about 24 hours, and then they're going to go to Woodbine. So I, I just, somehow we thought that somebody wanted them, so we saved them. Uh, but everything else, uh, thank you. And this is just part of, part of the growth and the life of the church. And it's okay, we will probably not die. So I apologize to those people in the nursery and children's church, of whom my wife is, uh, that we ran a little bit long today. My apologies. Uh, I will make it up by running normal time next time I preach. So let's stand. And we'll be dismissed. I mean, we're talking like seven minutes, okay? Sue me. You love it when the ball game goes into overtime. Or, or the concert people do the encore, right? Maybe we should do an encore. We should start doing that. So start clapping, yeah. And then we'll bring like Pastor Mark come out and do another 30 minutes or so. That would last once. Uh... <laughs> We can do it right now, but thank you, everybody, for being here. Make sure you shake somebody's hand and tell them you're glad to see them and enjoy some fellowship as we leave. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together uh, to worshiping who you really are. Lord, we thank you that you still manifest yourself in, in creation, in our lives, through your word. Lord, you still are alive. And Father, we thank you that we serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today. Lord, I pray as we leave this place, let us be doers of God's word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.